good morning, good afternoon, good evening, people, for joining us today for a very timely uh, discussion on the Indo-Pacific region, the role of civil society in the larger Indo-Pacific region. And I'm so happy and grateful on behalf of Cuts International, a 40-year-old global public policy research and advocacy group to welcome everybody for joining on this call. Uh, the timely subject, as we, we, we are witnessing, the multilateralism or the multilateral order is slowly losing its, its shine. We are seeing that polylateral, especially with regard to polylateral, it's the smaller organization working with the government uh, governmental organization going further and making an impact. Today on this timely subject and also as part of our Indo-Pacific Civil Society Forum, a forum or a co of coalition of civil society organization from the large swathe of Indo-Pacific region, where we discuss on various areas the challenges and we look forward for forward-looking interlinkages and areas to take it forward. With this, I'm really grateful and happy covering from dot to dot of Indo-Pacific. From the eastern coast of Africa, we have to the western part of, us, uh, of Australia and also the eastern part of Australia, along with interlinkages between in the middle areas, which is India, Taiwan, and likewise. So with this, and to further ado, I would like to request our chair and moderator, Dr. Prue Gordon, Executive Director, Australian Chair for International Trade and Investment, and also Distinguished Fellow, Cuts International Global Affairs, to take this forward. Before I proceed and hand over the rein, may I request uh, everybody to please be on mute until unless you are speaking. This goes for the speakers. And also, we will be followed uh, after 40 minutes of panel discussion with the Q&A. So I will request the audience members to kindly post their questions either in the question answer chat box or later when we open up to ask their questions. Now with this, I uh, hand over the ring to Dr. Prugon. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peru. Thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given me to moderate this really exceptional panel. It comes at such an important time, as you mentioned, when the world is, is really facing some major challenges. So. You've brought together an exceptional group of five speakers. So my job tonight, I'll start by introducing each of the speech speakers and give you some information about their background. Then each speaker will have between five to eight minutes to present their views and their insights on the topic and will then open up, as Peru mentioned, four questions. So let me begin by introducing our distinguished panellists. The first speaker tonight is Dr. Seshradi Chari. He's from the Centre for Indo-Pacific Studies, um, MAHE Manipal. Dr. Tawari is an accomplished academic and researcher specialising in the intersections of international relations, cybersecurity and policy studies. His work is particularly noted for its analysis of US cybersecurity policies and he's contributed both to academic literature as well as real-world policy applications. Through rigorous research and practical insights, Dr. Tiwari has positioned himself as a key figure in the study of cybersecurity within the broader realm of, of international relations. His research not only advances academic discourse, but also informs critical policy decisions, making him a truly a dynamic voice in the field of cybersecurity and global governance. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Um, Emmanuel Wachendo. Dr. Wachendo is a program officer with the International Trade and Development Program at the Institute of Economic Affairs in Kenya. Um, Emmanuel specializes in international trade and development policy. His expertise includes analyzing Kenya's trade relationships, industrialization strategies, and regional economic partnerships, particularly with India and China. Um, Dr. Wakendo also addresses the impact of maritime challenges such as the Babel El Mandar Strait crisis on global supply chains. His work at IEA provides critical insights into Kenya's role within East African trade dynamics, making him a significant contributor to discussions on regional trade and economic development. So welcome, Emmanuel. 
Our third speaker this evening, for, for me, it's this evening for those elsewhere, it's other times of the day. Dr. Sachin Tawari is a research fellow, fellow at the Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies in New Delhi. Um, Dr. Chari is a distinguished Indian public intellectual with a broad career spanning politics, journalism and foreign policy analysis. Dr. Chari's extensive experience in international development includes a consultancy role with the United Nations Development Program in South Sudan. He currently holds several key positions, including Director of the Forum for Strategic and Security Studies and Secretary General of the Forum for Integrated National Security. His academic and public policy contributions, particularly on pluralism, conflict resolution and interfaith harmony, continue to shape India's strategic and security landscape. Our fourth speaker for the evening is Dr. David Chung. He's co-head Asia Pacific World Forum Offshore Wind EV. Um, David Chang is a leading figure in international public affairs and strategic marketing. He has over a decade of experience in nonprofit organisations and has played a key role in fostering cross-sector collaborations between governments, industries and investors. He excels in navigating complex stakeholder relationships and developing initiatives that bridge public and private sectors. Focusing on sustainable development and international cooperation, David's strategic insights into public affairs and marketing make him a sought-after thought leader. He's influencing, he influences global conversations on cross-border collaboration and economic partnerships. So thank you so much for joining us today, David. And finally, a compatriot, um, Lucas Nagel, who's a PhD candidate at the School of Government International Relations at Griffith University. Lucas is, as I said, he's a PhD candidate. He's specialising in conflict resolution and peace building with a focus on sustainable cooperation in intercultural contexts, particularly in Asia. It's drawing on a background in political science and Asian studies. Lucas combines academic research with practical experience as a project manager and activist. His work spans youth empowerment, gender advocacy and social justice, using data-driven methodologies to address global challenges. Lucas is recognised for fostering collaborative environments and advancing peace-building initiatives, making significant contributions to the fields of conflict resolution and social transformation. So thank you all of you for joining us tonight for this really important conversation. To kick us off this evening, I'd, I'd invite um, Dr. Chari to lead off with the discussion. So, Dr. Chari, if you'd like to take yourself off mute, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gordon. Uh, it was so nice of you. Uh, I, I hope uh, uh, I'm audible. It's okay? Great. Okay, fine. So, here we go. Uh, first of all, uh, it was uh, very nice of uh, Indo-Pacific uh, um, Civil Society Forum to think of uh, such a subject and also think in terms of organizing uh, some sort of a, a discussion on this issue. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, this must be probably one of those very few organizations and very few occasions when we start, we, we think in terms of uh, civil society's involvement in, in, in a concept like Indo-Pacific. We all know that the development of Indo-Pacific has been there for a long time. In fact, earlier, before 2015, before it became a very prominent uh, issue, it was still called Asia-Pacific. So <clears throat> it was only sometime around 2007-2008 uh, uh, some of the Indian academicians started thinking in terms of a broader view of Asia Pacific. So the first time uh, this this whole idea came into prominence was when uh, the former uh, Prime Minister of uh, Japan, Shinzo Abe, uh, visited India and he spoke in the Indian Parliament. <clears throat> and he said, there is a very, very large scope for the world to think in terms of uh, a, a, an entity which will be 
confluence of two oceans so the words used by him was confluence of two oceans what he meant was the indian ocean and the pacific ocean so those countries which are probably bordering uh, or related to indian ocean and countries which are related to pacific ocean they all can come together and have some sort of a forum so this is how the whole idea of indo pacific emerged it's not that the indo pacific did not exist but the idea slowly transited it transited from asia pacific to indo pacific and sometime around 2015 when the americans finally accepted the indo pacific uh, navy naval uh, institution then the word indo pacific became more prominent and many countries around indo pacific began to think in terms of their own policies country specific policies towards indo pacific it's not an institutionalized forum yet unlike uh, sarc unlike uh, bimstec unlike brics <coughs> and uh, unlike asean but asean has an indo pacific uh, idea uh, many countries in south asia southeast asia far east Uh, pacific islands and asian countries which are attached to indian ocean rim association iora they all have no individual uh, views on indo pacific and they all have collective views on indo pacific also so this is where the citizens forum or a citizens group in every country Uh, begins to think in terms of indo pacific this idea of course has to grow farther from here mm, i may compare this whole setup or this whole idea to what we call the united nations has its own idea of uh, national groups what we call the federation of un associations every country has a un association if in in a country like india which have which has got 29 states each state can have an un association which will be some sort of a bridge between the common people and the government and the united nations un although the charter of un says the we the people of the world come together and to form a un but people of the world cannot be members of the united nations only countries can be members of the united nations so how do you link people stakeholders issues problems to solutions that are applicable for the place of problem and also solutions which can be replicated in different areas and different places we saw this issue very prominently during the mdgs minimum uh, millennium development goals which could not be completed in any country of the world so we have now shifted to sdgs what we call the sustainable development goals so this is where i think this whole idea the emerging idea of indo pacific can also think in terms of civil society organizations which will form some sort of a bridge between the civil society the local governments and if we are able to come out with something called indo pacific as an institutional framework at that time the institutional framework of indo pacific could probably be the third party or the third pillar of this kind of a structure but uh, that is why i think this this whole idea of civil society organization in the indo pacific is going to play a very important role and from that point of view this whole session assumes greater and much greater importance so we will be actually looking at three issues that is sustainable development climate change and security uh, apparently uh, security appears to be um, the odd man out here but security is not very odd when we consider the fact that sustainable development and climate change uh, impinges very greatly on the issue of not only national security but also regional security and global security so this is going to be an important aspect but of course security indo pacific as a as a, a, a security architecture for indo pacific uh, Uh, has to uh, has linkages with number of other factors geopolitical factors in international relations factor the dynamics of geopolitics is going to have a great 
effect on this security architecture of Indo-Pacific. So uh, that's an independent subject which we can deal at a uh, later day. But more importantly, uh, a social cohesion has to be brought in all the countries of Indo-Pacific. Uh, so from that point of view, sustainable development and climate change uh, assume much greater importance. It's not that the security architecture is not important, but I think more important than the security architecture, what is going to be uh, uh, more important for a civil society organization like us is going to be the idea of sustainable development and climate change. When it comes to sustainable development, again, we need to think of uh, various aspects. So if you take all the 17 goals, the most important goal that Indo-Pacific civil society organizations will have to address is one is health. Health has to be an important area where civil society will have to actively work with local governments and also work across local governments, across borders. Because health is not an issue, as we saw during the pandemic. Health does not respect international borders. Health issues do not respect international borders. Health issues do not respect the, the form of government that you have. The pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic has affected democracies. It affected dem dictatorships. It affected military regimes. It affected... Uh, multi-party democracies, it affected everybody in the world. It affected the rich, it affected the poor. So health is one issue which is going to cut across all barriers of economic and political barriers and including religious barriers if I may say so. It's not that uh, the countries which have, uh, we don't respect religion or which don't have a re religion at all, did not suffer. They also suffered. So it's going to cut across all these parameters. So health is going to be one issue where the civil society will have to act. And in many countries, we find that civil societies have acted very wisely as far as health issues are concerned when we saw that in the pandemic and we are seeing it even now. Similarly, um, we, we have to, as a civil society, we will have to think in terms of capacity building. Now, capacity building has three aspects. One is the capacity building as far as stakeholders are concerned. Another is capacity building as far as interface between academics and stakeholders are concerned. What we call um, industry, institution, uh, interface. So this industry institution interface has to work in terms of capacity building. And the third factor where the civil society can help is bridging the um, income um, disparity. This is where many civil society organizations and institutions can also work. So if you look at all this area of activity where the civil society has to get involved, I think it's more important that we think in terms of A, sustainable development, two, uh, growth without uh, and, 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 and industry which comes in to play where risk mitigation is involved. This is the second area where we have to work. And the third area where we have to work is health and creating awareness. So I, I, so I think uh, this is a very great idea and we may have to take these subjects separately, consider these separate subjects separately and maybe at some, some later stage we can have health experts speaking only on civil society and health issues. We can have experts on sustainable development who will take talk only in terms of sustainable development in industry and agriculture and civil society involvement. And we can have experts who will think in terms of capacity building of stakeholders and Indo-Pacific civil society organizations. I think uh, we can have more discussion on this during the Q&A. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Chari. You've really set out a wonderful agenda and, and a way forward in this discussion. I love your description of the linking role civil society groups play. I absolutely agree. I think it's a wonderful description. We'll now move on to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Wachendo. Emmanuel, I'll pass over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, that was a very, very uh, pithy introduction. 
I think picking up, uh, picking up from there, um, uh, I, to start off with, this is my first time being on this panel and uh, just to see the, that there is a clear match between ambition and uh, and what is, is is actually possible, and the fact that where the rubber meets the road is where the work of civil society is done is 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 very uh, inspiring to me. Now, the next thing I'll say as I continue is uh, just a very slight correction. I am actually not a doctor uh, yet, but I appreciate you know that was a very nice boost to my confidence. Um, now. I work at the Institute of Economic Affairs as a program officer uh, in charge of uh, the International Trade and Development Program and running our internship internship program here. Now, from Kenya's uh, from from where I sit and looking out into the the Indo Pacific region, what do I see and what do I think about what civil society can do to engage with the region? I think to start off with. It's very true that we don't have a clear ident Indo-Pacific um, identity, and the Indian Ocean region itself also does not have a clear um, uh, a clear identity. And this is posing the first challenge in terms of rallying civil society at the at the local level to look out onto the Indian Ocean and say, "Look, there are some there there could be shared interests here, and we are." united by by something that that uh, there is something here that brings us together there is um there is an economic and demographic endowment there are political endowments that 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 make it incumbent upon us to actually find where our interests lie and organize around them now what is the consequence of not having uh this identity well now as the world bifurcates uh, and we begin to think of ourselves in terms of whether we are aligned with China or whether we're aligned with the United States, um, then the, the lack of an identity means we look at issues in the Indian Ocean according to which side um, or, or which of these organizations uh, or, or which of these emerging uh, drifts we think we belong to. I'll now I'll give a quick um, uh, example. So uh, a country like uh, uh, Kenya that has mismanaged its fiscal and monetary policy over a period of 30 years, such that its, its peers in the Indo, its Indo-Pacific peers of, a, if we're standing in the year 1990, are now four times wealthier uh, to, uh, to 30 years later, while Kenya is only 25% wealthier, and then a country that finds itself with a constrained fiscal space, um, a country that when it seeks help from the IMF for its own irresponsibility, um, and then finds that, that uh, the IMF is suggesting that uh, it include climate mitigation measures as as a condition for receiving funds, then must ask itself whether climate is a prior priority where uh, it's finding itself so poor, but then at the same time must contend with very severe um, the severe consequences of of freak climate related disasters, right? All while it's trying to organize its fiscal space. Now, what does this mean? Kenyan org civil society failed to organize in time to meet this issue, the issue of, 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 of public debt, such that now even the issue of climate change, um, you, that their own um, the ambitions that civil society expresses must be constrained. So this same civil society must put on its intellectual um, uh, caps and conceptualize an Indian Ocean identity and recognize that failure in fiscal and monetary policy and any other area, failure to capture the big picture has consequences for, en for every Kenyan and it matters not which tribe they come from. And then by extension must recognize that it matters not, that, that in the very same way that when 
floods came earlier this year or when uh, the taxes were continued to rise in order for us to meet our de debt obligations, those taxes and those floods did not care what tribe we were. So then it's incumbent upon civil society to recognize and establish that identity to be at the vanguard of trying to organize uh, and join the, the Indo-Pacific grouping in addressing the issues, shared issues in the Indo-Pacific. Now, I'll close off my comments by pointing out what it is that happened within the Babel Mandeb Strait and in the market, in the global market for semiconductors. So on the one hand, you have uh, the piracy uh, and terrorism on, from Yemen and Somalia. We had actually suppressed terrorism, uh, I mean piracy, but, but when, when the assets of uh, the Americans and the Europeans had to go and focus on Yemen, piracy shot up again. Uh, and the data shows, data from UNCTAD shows that actually on a per capita basis, are uh, you know when relative to the size of the economy, Kenya and Tanzania were more affected by the Bambel Mandeb Strait than Germany was. So this means that it was a bigger concern for them, this singular maritime choke point. And so, but if civil society in Kenya cannot uh cannot see the big picture, then the Kenyan citizens and by extension. The same thing in Tanzania and all the way down across this side of the Indian uh, of the Indian Ocean will also suffer dire consequences. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love your your challenge to us to like not enable or not require the identity of Indo-Pacific to evolve, but actually let's push ahead and create it. And I think that's really forward looking, and I love that so much. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Now, could I please pass to Dr. Sachin Tiwari to take us on our next step in this discussion? Thank you so much, Prudence, for the introduction. Uh, so I am a research fellow at Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies, and m my specialization and work revolves around uh, technologies. And I will like, strictly keep to my own specialization because other experts are like uh, uh, going on the other aspects of the topic. So when we talk about emerging technologies and the role of civil society, the very first thing that comes to my mind is what is emerging technology in this context. And they can be referred to as frontier technologies that are being developed and started to being adopted on a large scale. So their impact on society is quite large and the uh, and many factors are unknown since they are still in the stage of development and many things will come up. One of the most talked about topics is AI, uh, which is like generally being talked about. On the other hand, when we talk about region, Indo-Pacific as a region itself, there are two contrasting features. First is the potential for vast economic development. We have got two biggest economies of the world right now, China and India in the region. And second is a contrasting feature that is concerns the vulnerability in sense of climate change, resources, inequality. So there is a, a, a potential for a trigger for a conflict. And the majority of the countries in the region rank from middle income to low income countries, uh, according to Human Development Index. The region is also home to 65 almost percent population. Uh, so, uh, so it's the biggest chunk uh, globally. Now, when we talk about the uh, uh, role of uh, a civil society uh, in this context, the very first thing that comes to my mind concerning emerging technologies is capacity building. As uh, uh, Shishadri Chariji mentioned it very clearly of the three aspects of capacity building. And in that workforce development is the most critical. And in the future, uh, as we talk about it, most of the population is either being affected or in future will uh, all the sectors will come uh, under the uh, fire of uh, new technologies as they are being adopted. Now, how to prepare and integrate the uh, population remains the key question. These are not novel to the region itself. 
uh, but here uh, there are large sections of the region which are quite vulnerable and there are severe questions about the livelihood accessibility etc in the whole region and when i think critically also about it there are these large corporate programs which been being run uh, one can go and easily find microsoft has got huge program with asean countries even in india it has got uh, uh, large corporate programs as part of its initiatives but one can question the impact of it generally when we talk about the larger population so what are the solutions that are required so one can be the use of large open source programs that are easily available and they provide the necessary technical tools required csos have largely been a reluctant i must say to adapt uh, the latest technology due to a very number of reasons and slowly and steadily there is this uh, uh, adoption of some kind of uh, these novel technologies that are coming up so there are uh, also presence of large number of open source community which are quite helpful and uh, one of the repositories which we all know is github uh, where most of our uh, programs etc comes up then there are uh, i was actually associated with the uh, 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 ngo also for more than a decade also and i worked on ground also and uh, one of the things i came across was uh, solutions like microbit so microbit are these small uh, devices available they are very cost effective uh, they are they are they are for uh, they are available in like circuit design coding kit and for uh, so they are used to train students from all the ages and they are quite successful in um, I, i met a person from morocco also and where they have got a very large pilot program running and so what is the need is for the larger population we don't actually require very large these general technologies that cannot be done on such a scale the only thing is we require to break down those technologies into simple bits that can be absorbed by certain segment of the population if we try to put something like a maybe a machine learning that is impossible besides the engineer who try to develop them there can be one aspect of the application that can be learned by the population and can be utilized in a certain section now related to is the part where assistance come so assistance is one of the larger parts of the csos and uh, uh, one of the first thing in assistance is the financial inclusion so digital public infrastructure has lately been talked about a lot and india's uh, success model of upi has been going around uh, so there are uh, so upi is based also on an open source model that anyone can actually develop a application on top of that you can go by any name it doesn't matter that's a base technology so uh, for the vulnerable population what uh, csos can done is that they can provide cost effective solutions uh, including upi that has been part on the other hand they can be a form of legal assistance to the migrants to the refugees and to the general population also uh, in form of that uh, ai Uh, can be integrated to easily understand these complex legal documents prepare easy documents uh, have a analysis of those complex documents like the court uh, hearings uh, and the court verdicts and aid the lawyers also to uh, 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 to help the general victim or the uh, or the plaintiff who has been uh, putting up the case in terms of uh, cyber security also csos can Sorry connect to victims to Yeah. Dr. Tawari, we're running out of time, so I'm just wondering if you could wrap up your presentation so we'll have time for the last two speakers. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll just uh, put it. So there are these live translation tools also, which can be very effective for refugees and migrants. Uh, they are unlike the past. In the conflict-ridden regions, uh, uh, resources can be collected and analyzed, such as the information on timing and location of bomb strikes and violent incidents. and most specifically concerning to this region is because we talk about indo pacific the pacific and the indo russian so large states are based have a maritime uh, uh, boundary or either are island states they can better manage their resources by the use uh, like the example of the drones that uh, to better manage the fisheries and uh, to assess the fish stocks and patrolling remote areas 
especially when we talk about uh, south pacific or indonesia which is a large archipelago um, and uh, and the last point i must uh, just conclude because shortage of time is shaping policy agenda so here cso's have got most important part is to highlight the part uh, where uh, technology has has ha is is having an adverse impact or any kind of feedback and inputs so one of the examples that come to my mind is that there is a discussion going on over the uh, rules flaming over the mining of the seabed uh, that is one of the uh, uh, discussions going on and seabed mining is uh, or will have a, a very adverse effect on the marine life that is quite known and that is the part where cso's has to really come up and pull up so the discussions are already i think in the united nations i'm not very much aware about the whole topic but that's the uh, situation right now and the last related to this is negotiations with the private sector uh, so especially in emerging technologies there is a huge difference uh, civil society go in one way and the private sector goes in one way and uh, there is a kind of a, a, a mistrust uh, due to uh, known reasons so uh, the engineers and product designers who are based in san francisco or uh, maybe berlin uh, won't have uh, uh, much idea about the local communities who are on the other part of the world so it is time to correct the unequal relationship between these stakeholders and uh, they can be done only through the cso's thank you i will uh, like i will answer anything in the questions uh, due to paucity of time thank you so much and I'm sorry, we are running out of time and we would love to get some questions. So I'd now pass to David. If I could ask you to keep your comments to maybe five minutes, I'm sorry to abbreviate it, but that would be great if you could. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I first like to thank the organisers and, of course, our moderator here and our fellow panel members. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm not a, a, a doctor. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so um, it is a lovely uh, opportunity to share and exchange with so many experts uh, on a panel to bridge, to align, and also to improve on all these important agenda that was mentioned so far. Um, so I work for the World Forum Offshore Wind as the co-head of Asia Pacific. Um, so most of my, my comments and angles will be from uh, in terms of perhaps climate change, renewable energy, and more specifically uh, regarding offshore wind. So, so first and foremost, I, I have to uh, uh, put it out there. So challenges are definitely opportunities the way I see it. And, and so all my comments are, are, com are coming from love. <laughs> so um, energy is actually a matter of national security, uh, definitely. Without it, our day-to-day -day would be quite a challenge. Um, and so in, uh, under, under the umbrella of WFO, World Forum Offshore Wind, we try to facilitate uh, the development of renewable energy and, and specifically offshore wind. Um, so we're very active uh, in, in Taiwan and in Japan and, and certain parts of the APAC region as well as Europe. And through this uh, groundwork, um, in comparison to our experts, uh, I have found certain, uh, or perhaps we could maybe identify a certain uh, topics that that perhaps uh, our experts can 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 uh, tackle here. So the first one is that we've discovered intergovernment department communications uh, sometimes lacks integration and, and therefore it creates a little bit of a confusion in terms of policy uh, uh, moving forward and and thus under the ministry level uh, perhaps the administration level uh, becomes working as an independent uh, mechanism and, and thus it's very self-centered and this is a pity because we see a lot of opportunities to maximize the effects of policy work uh, for example, uh, development of offshore wind, for example, I think the integration of uh, this particular agenda as well as local strengths and the interconnecting uh, opportunities with other economies within the region is is missed out, unfortunately, due to this uh, miscommunication uh, between governments uh, within the government sector umbrella as well as into departments. So that's that is something that perhaps we could as as um, as a nonprofit we could perhaps think about how we can mitigate that or or communicate that. And then uh, following that, uh, what is quite interesting is the uh, policy penetration to stakeholders and general public 
can be limited at some times. So we have uh, different governments within the region setting up very, very good and positive missions that we need to uh, move forward towards to. But unfortunately, I think I think that level of mission and uh, to to have to 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 sift down to to stakeholders and then to general public, that communication gap is great. is is dramatic actually. So we have, for example. If you want to develop offshore wind in, in, in any particular area, one of the stakeholders will be local residents or fisheries, for example. And the benefits of providing or, or, or developing renewable energy versus the perhaps a little bit of a, a, a not, not to say discomfort, but, but uh, not the, the, the inconvenience caused due to the development of renewable energy is somehow challenged uh, between these stakeholders and general public. And, and because they don't understand, uh, it leads to misunderstanding, misinterpretation. And the worst thing is uh, it leads to manipulation. So that is the most unfortunate uh, aspect, uh, what I've learned. And then uh, another aspect that perhaps we, we could perhaps look at is the different economies within the region sometimes are very much self-centered and, and for very good reasons, of course. For example, localization uh, policies uh, for, for industry development. But if you have a very self-centered mindset, and especially they are, uh, 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 you avoid the opportunities to collaborate within the greater region, you become uh, duplicated in resource and be every, everything that we do in, in terms of industry development or mission progress, it becomes expensive, becomes very slow, and it's just consume uh, a monster that consumes a lot of resources and then eventually just uh, becomes perhaps too difficult to, to continue further. Then my final point is that uh, lately, or, or for the past couple of years, we have been communicating from, from top to, to bottom and perhaps from bottom to up as well. We, I, ha I have realized that sometimes industry experts uh, prefer because of short of time, for example, and all the, all the, all the familiarization of, of a particular industry, we begin to use jargons <laughs> and terminologies that are sometimes alien to, 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 our, to our audience. And it's, it actually seems to be very, very minor, but if we, if we have this, this terms of this this method of communication, we we find ourselves very quickly lose the interest of our audience, and then eventually lose the lack of uh, support, um, and then it becomes a bit of a, a challenge if we want to to reinitiate or or to to further uh, expand our, our agenda. So so I think coming back to to the to the main topic, I think there there are a lot of work to be done, but. Um, uh, so I, I do uh, sincerely appreciate this sort of panel forming together so that we can actually share some of those common challenges that brings us together. And hopefully, as a, as a group, we, we could perhaps find a, 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 and remedy uh, one by one all of these different challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. I found myself in violent agreement with so much of what you were saying. Thank you. Lucas Nagel, can I please pass to you? Thank you for the final comments from our panel. Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, so spontaneously, of course, I'm here on behalf of um, Professor uh, Nedeville Wang, who is a leading expert on green transition in uh, Asia. So um, you'll have to bear with me. I'm sorry for that, but I'll try to um, make it worth your time. So in the next four minutes, Pops, hopefully I'm timing myself here. I'll try to very briefly touch upon um, what's going on politically in Myanmar and then try to lead it back to what is going on among young people in civil society across the globe and why are they important for the future um, of a lot of the um, topics and issues that you've touched, touched upon. So I just returned from um, six months of field work at the Myanmar Thai border because my research topic is youth activism in, um, in in the times of uh, democratic backsliding, which is of course a problem that's not only um, a problem here in the region, but a global issue. And so Myanmar is, is a case study that's interesting because it relates to what has been called in the last few years as the Milk Tea Alliance. And what we see is that there are a number of countries where young people really rise up to um, defeat and resist 
dictatorships such as in Hong Kong, in Thailand, and now also in Myanmar. And um, Dr. Cherry asked a question, uh, or he mentioned the dilemma that actually only uh, nations can be members in the United Nations to get things really done, and which are also funded by the Sustainable Development Goals, of course. So how do we link civil society and what they have to say? And young people in those countries and civil society have a very straight answer. We have to replace dictatorships. We have to replace corrupt um, governments who destroy systematically also the environment by um, governments which are much more sustainable and future oriented than the ones we have right now. And what we can see is that there is a lot of empirical evidence that is going against the stereotypes that scholars had for decades, that this generation is much more apolitical than previous ones. We don't join parties, or oh, not me, I'm now one year above, according to the UN, but let's say they don't, they don't join parties. It was very difficult to measure political engagement. And now we can see in various engagements globally, like Fridays for Future, of course, the Arab Spring, that young people are really coming forward. They have very clear ideas. They formulate them very clearly and they're very creative about them. And they're very angry that they're not being heard, that they're not being included. And so my final point is that um, we can see that now Generation Z and Alpha are really trying to get into formal and informal politics. Of course, very often this has been cited many, many times online. This is where they really move and communicate. And if we want to solve a lot of the problems that um, all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, have been touched upon, including um, climate change, inequality, um, and racism, and return of, of nationalism, then it's really, really important to listen to those voices of civil society, because a lot of those organizations are now being led by the young generation of very educated, but often also very angry people who have very clear political goals. Thank you. That's it from this point. Thank you so much, Ligas. Thank you for keeping to time too. Um, Peru has put in the chat, he's opened the chat and pointed to that as an opportunity for audience members to ask any questions if there are any. Uh, right. So I have received a question from Anjali and she's asking, does, and she's not directed this question to anybody, but it's open. Uh, does the geopolitical implications, such as the one in the Middle East and uh, middle of Europe, does how does that affect uh, the work of CSOs, especially with regard to the working in the larger Indo-Pacific region? Yes. So please. Yes. So actually, the, the geopolitical trends have very important effects on work on the ground. Uh, for Kenya, for me, uh, I give the the example of Kenya when. If the United States, for example, indicates that they will look the other way when kids are kidnapped um, uh, on the streets for protesting or for having any posture against the government, well, the local the government on the ground will do just that. And this is what we have seen in Kenya. So it's just so you contrast this period that we're in in Kenya to uh Ten years ago, say when when Barack was president, and he had some interest in in pressuring governments to conduct themselves a certain way. In in my own observation, the region had was not as characterized with, by this kind of sharp autocratic intervention into the lives of citizens as it is now. The final point is that in Kenya, and I think you know Kenya a country that made so much progress in opening up the space, most of civil society had been asleep to this reality because if they were awake, they would have had a strategic outlook on the future and say, look, in a situation where you have a United States that's less interested in that and where you have your political class being captured by uh, kickbacks from, say, the Chinese Communist Party, that this will create a situation of more sharp intervention, they would have organized before it happened. So yes, I think that audience members, uh, that to answer that question, geopolitics has an effect on the work happening on the ground. Any more questions, Peru? 
Uh, yes, there is one for Dr. Achari, and this is uh, there are issues related to funding and funding of the civil society organizations work. How do you see these uh, overcoming these challenges? Yeah, uh, Pushpendra, that is a very important question. Uh, funding plays an important role because civil society organizations cannot depend on government funding. So funding actually falls under two categories, depending on the form of government. Uh, for example, uh, governments, uh, there, there are countries where uh, it's a it's a uh, not a democratic government. In such places, uh, there is always a control over funding by the government. And there are democracies where funding is made by the government and there are non-governmental organizations or what we call non-profit organizations as in US, which, uh, which have funding. But there are so many rules and regulations, even in, in the case, if you take the case of India also, we have so many regulations which come in the way of uh, collecting funds as far as the uh, civil society organizations are concerned. But uh, for any good work that a civil society organization undertakes, there are always people who are ready to fund. And fund should not be an important uh, uh, constraint as far as projects are concerned. And this is my personal experience as far as uh, conducting projects in rural areas are concerned. If you have a good project, if you have a good solution, if you identify the project and if you are able to mix marry the project problems and the solution people understand and people come and support you so finance is not the only issue that should stop you from coming to forming a solution but finance of course is an issue as far as uh, the functioning of an ngo like civil society organization is concerned right thank you uh, this one is from shalini and this is direct towards lucas uh, since this is on Australia base, I guess, uh, prove if you can also um, take this question along with Lucas. Uh, this is with the challenge faced by the Pacific Island countries with regard to disaster management. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how do you see um, coalitions such as Indian and Australian CSOs working together in this region? And if you can give a few references of the work that they're doing, over to you. Yeah, I think I'll hand that directly to um, Dr. Gordon, um, because I'm uh, a foreigner in Australia. I just moved here two years ago. I've, I've, I've attended a lot of conferences. I know about the issue, but I'm not an expert. So it would be silly of me to, to comment on that. So, um, Professor Do Dr. Gordon, I think you know much more about that than I do. That might be a stretch, Lucas, but I will let you know what I, I know. I know the Pacific is a real focus for the Australian government, and they are stepping up a lot of funds to civil society and like, research organisations in particular to help build capacity within Pacific Island countries to help manage disasters that occur in the region. It is an absolute priority. In terms of working with India, I'm not familiar, and that's just because I'm not nowhere near an expert in this area at all. I'm not familiar with any specific initiatives where Indian and Australian governments are working together to support disaster management capacity building and, and response capacity in the Pacific Island. doesn't mean that there's not, it's just I'm not familiar with it. But I, I know that I think, um, yeah, it's an absolute priority for the Australian government to support them, particularly around the climate change piece and ensuring that we are helping Pacific Island countries prepare. I mean, think look, looking at trying to keep the world at 1.5 degrees of warming is looking extremely difficult. So helping Pacific Island countries prepare for, for what's coming down the track as well as what's happening at the moment. And I think they are supporting some civil society groups, as I said, as well as research groups to, to do that work. Yes, Can I come in? Can I come in, Pushpendra? Yes, please. Mm. Yeah, this is, a very, this is again a very important aspect. I'm glad that this question has come up. Uh, we should we should not forget one thing as far as disaster management is concerned. It was the reaction, India's reaction to the disaster of tsunami that actually reignited the idea of uh, Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific got a 
got a shot in the arm because of India's action. And then, of course, other countries which also took part in tsunami management. That was a great, uh, it was a horrible uh, disaster, but a great uh, opportunity for all of us to come together and reignite it. Now, we have uh, this uh, idea of early warning systems. So, uh, this again is one area where uh, civil society organizations, academics and technology people who are concerned with technology can work across borders on these early warning systems, which, we, which, which is happening actually. We are using uh, the satellite technology to really map the position of uh, the dangers that climate can face, uh, throw up. And uh, use of space is another area where we can work together on a number of issues because uh, Indo-Pacific essentially is a maritime concept. Uh, although it's not purely limited to maritime, so we have a very great opportunity to work on maritime challenges that we are facing as far as um, all the countries, stakeholders are concerned. So it's a good, good question. Could I just add one small comment that I think disaster management is an issue that enables, creates an opportunity to learn how to cooperate together, both civil society groups as well as governments working with civil society groups. And I think having identified those areas where we could focus work, Dr. Chari, I think disaster management is another one where civil society groups could come together to talk about how we can cooperate to build capacity in that area. That's that's well taken. I guess if uh, somebody else um, have any other point, otherwise we are about we have reached the time. So over to you, to or Sachin. You 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 would like to come in here? Yes. Uh, regarding the disaster management, uh, so uh, most of these uh, high end technologies have been part of the state's uh, security apparatus, and they were not available. So as seen in Ukraine also. So the satellite imagery in the open source field is quite uh, uh, has come down and easily accessible. And one of the practical parts is Australia has got uh, excellent uh, satellite imagery uh, sharing capabilities. And uh, uh, in the vast swaths of the Pacific uh, Ocean, uh, uh, especially by the civil society, uh, because there is a, a huge uh, uh, difference between the national security use and for the civil society use. So the open source uh, uh, imagery can be used easily to track over time. And that would be very helpful uh, if something happens in a Pacific Islands and one has to wait for over weeks uh, for some help to appear. And even after that, uh, relief work is very normal. Thank you so much for those comments. Oh, I just feel like we've really just scratched the surface. There is so much to talk about and to consider and, and look at ways we can collaborate together. Can I please thank Cuts International for organising this panel and the just an exceptional group of panellists who I could spend many hours on this call with you. Just you've brought such insights and your knowledge and expertise. So thank you so much. Uh, can I please say how grateful I am for the honour of moderating this panel and I hope it's the first of many to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chair and Moderator, and also the expert panel and our audience who have been patiently listening. Although there would there are some more questions, but we have we would have another time. The idea of civil society organization. And we have collated the points that each one of you have mentioned, which are very valuable. And we are going to take forward the ideas. Um, there were large areas of discussion from Indo-Pacific Civil Society institutional framework to what Generation Alpha is looking at. From seabed mining to space, we have covered large areas, but what we need is to break down these discussions for a larger and approach-based uh, discussion to take it forward. So I'm really grateful and thank you uh, for, for each one of you uh, to be here. And we would take this forward as policy recommendation, policy initiative under the Indo-Pacific Synthesizing Forum that we have and look forward to many further uh, webinars. Thank you once again. Take care and now it's time to say good night because I started with good morning and good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> now I would say good night. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you.